to Ephesians chapter 1, please, right now. <laughs> Glad to see you all, and I hope you're enjoying the holiday season. <clears throat> and I know that I've been gaining a little weight in the holiday season. I've been careful. Eating so much. Pastor, did you pray for Megan? She, they took her to the hospital. Father, we just pray for Megan. She's a sweet girl. Lord, we just thank you for her and her life, and we ask you to bless her, Lord, whatever is causing, Lord, this hurt. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would give uh, wisdom to the doctors, and most of all, that you are the great physician. Yeah. Touch her and deliver her from it, and we rebuke it off of her life in Jesus' name. We thank you, and we, we agree together for it. Amen. 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 All right, Ephesians chapter 1. And we're studying, we're, we're going through this, this book. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this word that empowers us and encourages us, equips us. We pray, Lord, for your anointing upon the preaching and the teaching of it. Lord, I pray that your words would be my words, your thoughts, my thoughts. And anoint our eyes to see truth, our ears to hear your voice. Speak to us, Lord. Our minds to have comprehension and our hearts to be full of faith so that we can believe and benefit and be glorified by it. And Jesus, we exalt you and we praise you. And we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. And, and everybody said amen. 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 Okay. Ephesians chapter 1. And um, <clears throat> starting with verse, let's look at 16. So Paul is writing this book, uh, this amazing book of Ephesians, to the church at Ephesus. And, uh, and uh, you know, there's so much doctrine in this book. And, it's just an amazing book. And, and you can study this your whole life and keep getting revelation from it. Uh, but he's praying for this church now. And he, and he said, he, doesn't, he ceases not to give thanks for, for them. Now, I think that's a good way to pray. Because when you pray in faith, you pray thankful. Yes. Because you expect and believe that God is going to answer your prayer. Yes. Uh, the, the book of Philippians says, let your requests be made known with thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And right, does it say that? Yes. Why is that? Because God's going to hear you and he's going he's to respond to you. Mm -hmm. but, but let me tell you this, though. Uh, when you pray with thanksgiving, it's a prayer of faith. Because if, to receive from the Lord, you have to believe. Amen. That's just the way it is. Why do some people not receive? Some people do believe. It has everything to do with faith. And, uh, and, and, and people, sometimes people get confused because they say, well, I do have faith. But there's a difference between faith and hope. We hope, and hope is a great thing. Faith, hope, love, these three abide. Hope is a great thing because hope, at least you're expecting a good outcome. And, and that's the beginnings of what you need for faith. And we should live our whole life because we don't walk around with supernatural faith for everything every day. But we can walk around with God-given hope for a good outcome in anything we face in all, all the days. You know, so hope is very important. We hope for the best. We should be, which means that we should be a positive people that are expecting good outcomes to things. Amen. And if you're a positive person and if you're a thankful person, you won't be a complaining person mm -hmm. or, or a person that confesses things that are the opposite of what God's promises say that we can have. So hope is important, and thankfulness is important, but faith is something that comes from the Spirit of God. It's a gift. It's one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, the greatest faith that any of us could have is when we believe on Jesus Christ, that he's the Son of the living God, that he died for our sins, that he rose again from the dead, that he ascended into heaven, that he's at the right hand of the Father, that he's there making intercession for us, that he's coming back victorious as the King of kings and the Lord of lords to reign upon the earth for a thousand years and then will enter into a new heaven and a new earth and his kingdom shall be forever. That, that he's glorified there. That all of that is 
is think that we need to be saved. Because if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart, God raised from the dead, we'll be saved. And fortunately, that's a, a gift that God will give to every man whose heart is open and willing. We can believe on the Lord and, and receive him. Uh, but uh, it's not religion. You know, some people, I know uh, I, I was talking to, to our brother Greg, and he was talking to somebody who kind of acknowledges God, but the man was saying, yeah, but, you know, why even bother? Because everything's predestined. Well, that's not true. Uh, things are not all predestined. What God has predestined, we saw in Ephesians chapter 1, is that we would go to heaven. He wants us to go to heaven. He gave us a destination. He preset that destination that we would get to heaven. But there's a way to get there. And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. God has not predestined some to be lost. He foreknows that some will be lost. And he foreknows who will be saved. But he predestines all to be saved. That's why it says he's not willing that any should perish. And that's the difference. There's been that argument in the church ever since uh, Calvinism and Arminianism. The Calvinists believe that everything's preset. You know, you're, 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 the Lord decides who gets saved, who gets lost, and then they have no choice in the matter. But that's not, that's not the truth. That, that's Calvinism. Though. There's a lot of the church that believes that. But the problem with that doctrine is it robs you of your motivation. Because why be motivated? God's already preset it. You're not going to change anything. It's already set. But that's not true. Uh, the Bible says, whosoever will let him come. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. So if he's not willing that any should perish, then why would he preset some to perish? It would be going against his own will. Okay? Uh, so we understand that God has destined us for his glory, for a relationship with him. He did that before he even created the earth. Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world because he foreknew the problems. He, can for, he created time. He lives outside of time, looks down into time, and gives us verbal, the book of Revelation, which is the end of the age, and he gave it to us at the beginning of the church age. Because God is outside of time, and, and he can, can encompass it and see it and comprehend it. Uh, but we live within time. We live within our experiences, within our relationship with the Lord. And we have to believe on him. We have to trust in him. And we're the ones that have to walk through all the stuff that we walk through. And we walk through with thanksgiving. We walk through with hopefulness. And, uh, and sometimes we walk through with a, a supernatural faith that can move a mountain. Now, how does a person get that kind of faith? It comes from, Greg, you were talking about having a relationship with the Lord. That comes from having a relationship yeah. with the Lord. Because, you see, the Lord speaks to whom he knows. Mm -hmm. Those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and those who wait on the Lord, they were, I, I, I was making an observation. Uh, it's funny, while you were singing here today, Trace, I was thinking about this, about how uh, God has, God is, and I was thinking of the scripture I was going to preach too, when it talks about the exceeding greatness of his power. God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent, okay? And so his power is unlimited. So everything that has power, whether it be natural power, spiritual power, whatever, kinetic power, whatever it may be, it is all created by God. He's the source and the creator of anything that's power, that has power or that is powerful. God created electricity. God created nuclear uh, he, he, energy. He created the nucleus. He created the atom. Mm -hmm. that, and man has learned how to break up the atom and then the power that holds that atom together is so terrific that it, it'll destroy cities when you loose it, when you bring it into a state of chaos. But, uh, but we all have our phones. I have my iPad. You know, and we we plug these things in to charge them, don't we? Yeah. Charge them. Yeah. We're, we're the lights are on in the room here because there's a there's there's a plant somewhere that's producing power that is going through the the, the wires to alter our homes. This is all hardwired. This electricity some plant somewhere, probably Turkey Point, where there's a nuclear power plant. Isn't that interesting? Yes. And everything that God created, and, and, and the power that's in the atom, everything is from him, and he's all powerful. We have to sustain our energy levels. So we eat. We sleep. What, what happens when we sleep? We recharge our, ourselves. When we eat and drink, we're recharging ourselves. When we wait upon the Lord, we renew our strength. 
We recharge ourselves spiritually. We mount up with wings. We walk and we run and we, you know, we fly. We can do whatever we have to do, but it comes from recharging ourselves. We have to plug in to the power source. And that's what prayer is. That's what waiting on the Lord is. And, uh, and, and the spiritual side of, of powering up is different than the natural side. Because you can get all powered up spiritually by fasting, when you, whereas physically you better eat something, right? True. Even though they say that if you <laughs> fast, that fasting, uh, it releases human growth hormones in your body. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And that people that fast regularly actually live longer and they stay younger longer. Wow. Yeah, because it, well, it, it actually releases the, the production of human growth hormones. Uh, and, uh, and if you fast 16 hours a day, they say that if you, when you're on the 16th hour of your fast, the human growth hormones kick in stronger. Yeah, very interesting, I think. But you have to recharge. You know, we, we have to get to the, we have to wait upon the Lord. We have to plug in to the life of the Spirit. We recharge by partaking of the living Word. Jesus said that my Word is a Spirit and is life. The Scripture says that the Word of God is alive and powerful and has power in it. And so how do we then receive faith that has enough power to move the impossible, to move a mountain? Jesus used the mountain simply because it's impossible for a man to move a mountain. Couldn't do it. We're too small. But if you have faith, of, of, a little bit of faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you can actually speak to the mountain. You don't even have to touch the mountain. Be removed and cast into the sea. It'll be done whatever you say from the past. That's what Jesus said. Isn't that interesting? And so how do we get that kind of mountain-moving faith? We get it because we plug into the Lord, and then he gives us a word. And the word is more powerful than the nuclear bomb, than the nuclear power plant, than an atom. The word created the atom. The power behind it, the power that's in the atom is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was, was God. The word was with God. All things were made by him that were made. The word, Jesus is the word made flesh. That's why he has all power and authority in heaven and earth. Because he is the word. Amen? And the word created all things. The word was God. The word was with God. So we can get full of the word. We get full of power. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so the ear is the plug into the power source. But it's the spiritual ear. Jesus said, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit says. And so if we plug into the power source with our spiritual ears... That means you got to unplug other things that you're listening to. The devil will talk to you. When the devil talks to you, he's stealing power. He's lying to you. The devil is a liar, and the liars will discharge you. The truth will empower you, make you free. You'll renew your strength. The word of God will give you a, 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 a grain of mustard seed faith that, that can move a mountain. Isn't that amazing? When you think about it, how many atoms are in a mustard seed, it's probably... Millions. And all you got to do is break one little atom and blow up a city. Uh, you know, I'm not speaking uh, from, uh, from, you know, from something that I learned in college. I'm just like speaking from what is, what is that? Look at Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Because they split an atom, dropped it on the city. It was horrible what it did. But imagine if you had that kind of power, the power that can be destructive it is also creative. It's God's power that created it. You can create by your words. If God gives you a word and you speak a word that God has given to you, you can bring creative power into, into reality. You can save the night. You can move things. But you've got to have faith. And faith comes by hearing. And hearing is when you plug in to the voice of the Spirit of God that comes from waiting on the Lord, that comes from meditating on the Word of God. Listen, if you don't read the scriptures and know the scriptures, you're going to have very little faith. You're not going to move mountains. You're not going to have miracles. And you're, not going to, you're not going to see the, the glory of God in your life without the word of God in your heart. Because this is the source of where it comes from. It's the word. Are, are you with me? And then when you have the word, you've got to agree with the word. You have to submit and subject your mind unto what the word says. Agree with it. And that's where faith comes in. You have to believe it. And then you, you wait on, see, we all, we all believe, most of everybody here in this room, we believe in the logos. That's the Greek word, that's the word in Greek, for word, logos. But it's, it's a general term. 
It means all the written, all the expressed word of God that's found in the Bible. That's the logos. Okay? But when it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, that's the word rhema. It's a different Greek word. And that means a specific word that is targeted to the hearer. Okay? That's exactly what it means. It's a specific word targeted to to the hearer. And if you're the hearer, it's you. And if you can hear what the Lord is saying to you concerning your issue, mm -hmm. then it will produce the faith in you if you choose to agree with it and speak it out of your mouth and the mountain will go. Just how it is. That's how it works. It's that simple. But there's not a shortcut to that kind of miraculous faith. It comes by plugging into the power source. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Mm -hmm. Amen? And, and by the way, once you get it, it doesn't mean you have it all the time. You, you use it up. You have to renew it. You have to replug in. You have to have a consistent life of devotion and meditation in the Word of God and waiting upon the Lord. Walking in obedience will ramp it up. Disobedience discharges the power you receive. Uh, are you with me? Amen. That's why we have to walk in Because when you walk in obedience, you're walking in agreement with the precepts of the Word of God, and the Word is where the power is. Uh, are you getting this? I didn't know I was going to teach this today, but the Lord knew. Good. Amen? Amen. And, and it's important. And so when I was praying today, I know what the praying is praying in tongues. And whenever I pray in tongues, God gives revelation when I teach. And so I believe that the Lord just wants you to have this. Yes. It, it, it's so simple. Every issue of our life can change with this simple precept of understanding how faith and the word and the power of God works in our life. And that's what Paul is going to be teaching about here. This is what he says. He says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Uh, now that, that is an extraordinary term. I'll come back to it. The Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. What, the things that I've just been telling you come from the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's what it is. Okay? Uh, because when you have a, a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, who he is, how his word operates, how God responds to us in our relationship to him, uh, his authority, his power, uh, his purposes. It's, he says, so I pray that you'll have the spirit of wisdom, revelation, knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding become enlightened. That the eyes of your understanding, you have to be able to see it. Sight and vision is very, very important. The scripture says, in, I think Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish. You have to be able to see what God is showing you. God wants to show each of us something. Once God shows it to you, uh, he, you know, he'll, he'll generally show it to us through his word, but words create pictures that you can see, don't they? How many of you like to read? Good. Why, why do, when I was a kid, I used to love to read. Uh, you know, I can remember the first book I ever read. It was a book about some little cre animal creatures in the woods and they, they walk around the lake. That was the first book I ever read by myself. And it was an exhilarating experience. And I came out and I said, this was great, mommy. I gotta have more of these books. And she bought me a whole stack of books and I would just read these books. And of course, I didn't stay in those books. And so for Christmas time, my parents used to give me books. And they would give me the classics and adventure stories and Robin Hood and all that. And I would spend the whole Christmas vacation reading books because the words and the books created pictures in my mind I actually lived the experiences. I went on the adventures. I could see it. I could taste it, touch it, ex experience it with my five senses just through seeing the words. But words, the words that you see on the page are, are just another form of the spoken word. Uh, the spoken word is nothing more than vibrations that go over the airwaves and a form from the, that we recognize. The written word is the same thing. It has life, it has power to it. And it creates something in us and helps us to see something. So when God speaks his word to us, it creates vision so that we can see that the eyes of our understanding become enlightened. God shows us what he wants us to know. 
what he, and what we can expect to experience. Praise the Lord. Now, that will, that will give us two ways to go. First of all, it gives us a goal to head towards because we see what God wants us to have. Okay? And number two, then, it, it helps us to recognize when something is taking place that is not of God because we also have an enemy. And he is, he is a hinderer. He hinders things. Okay? And when he hinders us, uh, he's trying to stop us from reaching the goals that the Word has produced and given to us. And it is creating for us. He hinders us. And, and he'll do it many ways. He'll, he'll do it by tempting us and trying to get us to compromise. Because if we compromise, we get discharged. We lose, lose the power. He does it by trying to appeal to emotions that, that may be negative. He tries to discourage us. We go through things that make us feel like, oh, not another problem, not another this. That. Let me tell you something. If you decide that you made a decision to serve the Lord, you will have opposition. Okay, we're not just put in this world just to have happy days. You understand? Uh, just to have a picnic every day. Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. He says, as I am in the world, so are you in the world. Did Jesus have happy days all the time? He had nothing but problems from, from the people and the devil. Until finally the people and the devil crucified him. Uh, but he allowed it to happen because he knew that out of that crucifixion was coming resurrection. And when he rose from the dead, he defeated death. And he assured that every single one of us can face any trial we go through. Because even death itself is defeated. Right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So we win. Hallelujah. And so we're more than conquerors through him. He always causes us to triumph. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to realize that we're here with a mission. And the mission is to uh, further the kingdom. Okay? And, and that, that mission to further the kingdom requires of us to, to be committed to that mission. And to push forward. And so the, the devil's going to come along try to knock us off, off course. He'll appeal to many things. It's like the, the parable of the sower and the seed. The, the good seed brings forth fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. Then some of the seed gets distracted. Some, some of it says when trials and persecution come, they give up. That's the seed that, uh, that what does it say? Yeah. It must be that. Yeah, choked out by the, by the thorns. And, yeah, now the cares of the, and the riches and the... And, and the, and the so-called blessings of life also choke out the word. The deceitfulness of riches is what it talks about. Right. And choke out the word so that they become unfruitful. <laughs> they get to pursuing riches instead of kingdom. Amen. We have to pursue the kingdom of God right. and the purposes of God. And, you know, and it's good to have money while you're doing that because then you can finance things. But that's not necessary. Jesus didn't go around highly financed. He, he went around highly anointed. And if the anointing is there, then the provision will come. Are, are you with me? Yes. And so he says, here's what he says. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention for my presence, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. And he is the Father of glory because he wants us to experience the glory. Now, why do people achieve, try to achieve wealth and power? Because they want glory. Uh, well, you know, when, when you have lots of money, do you, you ever watch uh, that Bob Massey on TV? Yeah. The property man, yeah. Bob Massey on, on the Fox Business yeah. Channel. Yeah, he's got the white hair. Yeah. Anyway, he goes into the, these very rich homes in, in, out there in uh, Las Vegas, is it? And some of these multi-million dollar homes, he goes in there. And when, pe when you walk into those homes, you can see that the people are trying to take their money and turn it into an architecture, and turn it into technology sometimes, part of that architecture, that produces a very glorious experience. See? Because why do people want wealth? Because it makes their life feel more glorious. They dress, they look glorious the way they're dressed, and the cars are glorious looking cars, the homes are glorious looking cars. But I want to tell you something, that's just temporary stuff, and it turns to dust, the disciples said to Jesus, look at these good buildings here, the temple. He said, look at them. They're, 
It's so glorious. He said, I tell you one thing. He said, not one stone will be left upon another. Right? That's what he said. What we're looking for is the glory of God. Amen. The glory of the kingdom. It's eternal. It doesn't change. You can have that glory uh, like Paul and Silas in a prison and experience the presence and the glory of God. He is our tabernacle. He is our hiding place. It's under his shadow that we abide Amen. in the secret place of the Most High. He, he, he is where our glory comes from. Amen. Amen. And so, listen, our happiness does not depend upon our possessions. A man's life doesn't consist of the things which he possesses, Jesus says. A man's life consists uh, of, his, of his portion of God. Amen. That's where the glory is. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 And so, here's what he says He says, The Father of glory. He's the father. He created glory. It's his, glory is something that God thought of. We would never even know what something glorious is unless God hadn't created something glorious. Yes. The father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. It's the knowledge of him. It's the wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened so that you can see. Right? We were just talking about having a vision for where God is sending us. The, the purposes that we have in our life. We have to be able to see it, believe it. That's why some people aren't very committed to church because they don't really see as their part in the church uh, family. It, it's just that significant. They have no vision. But we all have a part in the church. Yeah. We, have to see the, we have to see the purpose of the church. And the church has to be a big team. It has to be a, an army. The church has to be a, an organization of people that have the same purpose in mind. And that is to further the name of Jesus Christ and to do it on every age level and to do it as significantly and as broadly as we can. And it, and it takes people working and laboring and, you know, in many ways for the church. It takes people showing up to come to church. That's just being in church and sitting in the pew will influence people who come to visit. People come to visit and they see there's eight people in the church. They think, well, this person doesn't have much to say because if other people aren't following, see, crowds draw crowds. Yeah, Isn't that true? Yeah. And so if you're there and you're enthusiastic about the word of God, someone comes in, they're going to see your enthusiasm and it's going to affect them because you influence people just by your presence. Yeah. Amen. I, I can remember when I was first being witnessed to by Christians that I gave such a difficult time to and, and that I cursed at and hid and argued and did all kinds of stupid things with but when I would see them together, and they would greet each other, they would seem so happy to see each other, they would hug each other, and, and these were teenagers. My, my teenage friends didn't do that. We were too cool for that kind of thing. You didn't go, you know, hugging each other. And, but the guys hung guys, and girls hung girls, and girls hung guys. And I was so happy to see you. Praise the Lord. And these kids were on fire for the Lord. There was something about that that just made me feel like, you know what, these people are from a different planet. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't in a negative way. It was like something I had never seen before. Right. It, there, was, there was something that, that had a, a presence to it. Yeah. And Jesus said, when men see the love that you have one for another, they'll know that you're my disciples. And I, I was realizing in a way that I didn't realize that, that I was realizing, that I realized, wow. that they were, they were the Lord's disciples. Yeah. That's, that's what Christians were supposed to act like. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's important that, that we care for the brethren, that we connect with the brethren, because we're influencing people by our faith and our love, our hope and our faith and our love. Christians are going to be positive people with great expectations of what's to come, that's hope. And then faith, people that connect and plug into the presence of God through their devotions and in the word of God, so that they know that that mountain can be removed out of their life, and that they see the mountains removed. Because I want to tell you something, when one mountain goes, there's another one following we don't run out of mountains, okay? This, in the world, you will have tribulation, Jesus said, but be of good cheer. I, will, I have overcome the world. Praise God. Amen? Be of good cheer. So we, have, we are people of cheer. We are people of overcoming. We're people of, of the glory of the Father. Amen? The Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling when God called you, he, he gave you an expectation of what is to be in your life. The Lord speaks to you in many ways. He told me I was called to the ministry. The Lord probably has spoken to you through the word, through people that have speak, spoken to you about your life. And he gives you an expectation. That's hope. 
that comes that when you are abiding in Christ and you're following him and you're, and you're being obedient to him and disciplined in your walk with him, that you can expect something to take place in your life that's good. Amen. Praise Hallelujah. the Lord. Amen. Amen. And, and let me tell you, I have a calling on my life. I've been walking with the Lord since 1971. Mm -hmm. And the Lord called me like right away, got involved in ministry right away. Uh, and, uh, and I've been a pastor for many years. We, we lost our building. Our congregation was very small. But I don't know if you noticed, I haven't lost any hope. Amen. I haven't lost any positive expectation. Praise the Lord. Because I know it's the same God who's, who was there before. I don't know what he's doing now. And I don't know why he did what he did. But all I know of this is I expect good things. I expect a revival. I expect there to be a new and fresh outpouring of the miraculous in this church. I expect to see people saved through this church. Amen? And the, the Lord has brought me through health issues. And he brought me through it and out of it. Praise God. And you know, hey, listen. The early disciples, they didn't have to worry about a lot of the health issues that we do because they were just killed early. They never had to get old. You, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they didn't have to worry about getting old and getting sick. And going. They, they just... In the prime, they were just put to death, all except for John. In prison, yeah, put in prison. And uh, hey, Steph, can you can you grab me a cup of water or can? Give me a cup of water. <clears throat> Thank you. Dear. And uh, and but listen, when we can overcome, we can be strong in our in our old age because we we're spiritually strong. Our spirits are the strength of our life. Is that right? That's what gives us our strength. Uh, our joy comes from our spirit and it comes from our relationship with the Lord and the joy of the Lord is our strength. Thank you, dear. Thanks. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So he says uh, that, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. And, and I want you to think about your calling. First of all, you're called into the kingdom. That produces hope that is boundless. Because you're called to be a child of God. Praise the Lord Jesus. Isn't that something? Yes. You've become his son, his daughter. Yes. And, and that you, you will see him one day face to face. And you live eternally in the kingdom of God. And that you are a peculiar people. You're a royal generation. You're priests and kings unto our God. All of these things haven't been fully realized yet. Because right now we're, we're in this particular time in history. But at, but at the resurrection and the glorification of the body of Christ. These things will be fully manifested. And the hope that we have in our future is beyond what we could possibly even understand right now in the natural. But the Holy Spirit gives us inklings of these things. And the more hope you have for eternity, let me tell you something, the greater uh, you'll be able to sacrifice it in the present. These people sacrifice their lives. Do you understand what it meant to follow this man Jesus and see the miracles that he did? Well, the miracles that he did, I mean miracles healing so many sick people all the time, multitudes, feeding thousands and thousands of people with a few loaves and fishes. He did that twice. Walking on the water through a storm, calming the storm just by speaking to all these miracles that he did were absolutely amazing, right? But you know what happened? When he was crucified, they all ran and hit for their lives and they were ready to give up and discouraged and they didn't know what to do. That they were, they were just, that was it. Even though he spoke to them, told them, going to rise again, they were just. But then when they, when these same guys who were hiding for their life, who ran away from Jesus when he was being betrayed, took off and ran for their lives. <coughs> Peter denied, you know, said, I don't even know the guy, cursed. Right? But when they saw him raised from the dead, when they saw him alive after he had been dead in their sight, hanging there bloodied and un, uh, practically unrecognizable because of the torture he had undergone. And they saw him there with nails in his hands and feet with the blood pouring out of him. When they saw that he had a spear put into his side so that out came blood and water and then laid in the tomb. And when after they saw him raised from the dead, these guys caught the vision. They realized that there is nothing to be afraid of in this life. Because they can kill you, but we're coming back. And they became the most fearless individuals the world has ever seen. They went right out into the thick of things 
and preached the gospel and suffered. And if you read the history of the apostles, they suffered terrible deaths, torturous deaths. Uh, one of them, they, they skinned them alive. Uh, I mean, just uh, pull them apart with, with horses. And I mean, the things that they did, Paul, they chopped off his head. Uh, uh, you, you can read about the lives of the apostles, the, 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 the goriness of their deaths. Uh, you know, we're, we're right up there with how Jesus died as, as far as his gory pain. Uh, but, but let me tell you something, though. They, didn't, they weren't afraid to do it because they knew they saw him alive. They not only saw him alive, they saw him walk through the wall and enter the room. Imagine that. They saw him ascend into heaven accompanied by angels on the Mount of Olives. And then they saw angels say, what are you staring up there? Go do what he said. Yes, let's do it. And they went and did it. And they went to the upper room. Then they saw the Holy Spirit descend like tongues of fire on their head. And they heard the sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. And they began to speak in tongues. And then they went out and preached and saw thousands come to the Lord. And then they started healing the sick themselves. Although they had done it because he had sent them out two by two prior to that. Isn't it amazing? What, what just seeing the Lord resurrected will do for you. Okay? That, that's what the rest of this is about here. This, this is what Paul is praying. That the church, who had never seen Jesus with their eyes, like you and me, would, would be able to perceive. He says this. He says, the, the hope of his calling. Uh, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You see that these guys were willing to give up everything because they knew that they were going to inherit everything. Imagine that. Inherit everything. Jesus has said to them, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were going to get everything. Uh, he said, In my father's house are many mansions that go to make a place for you. Wow. That's a good retirement plan. A mansion in the house of God. That's not even retirement. That's that's living. You think retirement when you're old and weak, but these people will be renewed with strength that man has never yet experienced outside of Christ Himself. The, the glory of His inheritance. The Bible says there's an inheritance laid up in heaven that fades not away for us. Jesus said, "When you live your life, live it so that you have a greater inheritance there than worried about stuff here." Live for the inheritance that's coming, that's eternal, that will never fade away. But I'm telling you, we need to get back to some of this type of study and preaching because I hear a lot of preachers that preach great sermons, but it's generally about how to, to feel good today. About how to be happy now and, and how to get along with the people at work and how to get along with your aches and your pains and, and all, all. That, that, that's okay. No, there's nothing wrong with that. You need a little, a little wisdom. But I want to tell you something. If we put our eyes on eternity, you know, the, the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace, like the old hymn used to say. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. The scripture Paul wrote says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Praise the Lord. Looking to him. Christ, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. That's what it says. We have so much to look forward to. Every day should be the happiest day of our life, no matter what circumstance we're experiencing that day. Because of the future. And because of the presence of God that we already have. The hope of his calling. The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And here's what I was saying. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? We have not hardly tapped the reality of the greatness of God's power in our life. Amen. I've seen some great things in my, my life. Uh, I've seen creative miracles. I've seen lots of healings. I've seen the Lord do amazing things. And uh, you know, I, I, I remember even that one time the Lord showed me that it was going to be, he showed me a, a nuclear explosion going off. And in my mind I knew it was Cuba. Remember that story? Yeah. Some of you part of it, partook in that time. And I, and I said, there's going to be a nuclear problem from Cuba. And I told the other pastors that I was meeting with on a weekly basis 
a weekly and monthly, I forget now, but I told them and they said, oh, okay, brother, we'll pray about that. You know, like, yeah, okay, another guy with, you know, visions. And, and, and I said, I'm telling you, every time I close my eyes, I see it. In black and white, I can see this nuclear cloud and it's from Cuba. And so I said to the church, we're going to have a prayer meeting, an all-night prayer meeting. And we prayed. And we prayed till about 2 in the morning and everybody was gone, you know, after that. And I stayed longer than that. Then, then I told it, then the next, that was Saturday. Then the next day was Sunday. I, I told the church, uh, I think, I think, I don't know if I called them or I told them, but I was able to communicate somehow to the church that we're going to pray again the next night all night long because it didn't lift. I don't know if I told them before they left a lot or not or called people. But we had two nights in a row, all night prayer meeting. And we stayed there and we prayed. And I remember some of the young guys uh, praying. Like uh, I remember hearing Anthony Lolly praying, Lord, you know, if, if this is real with the pastor, and I would say, Anthony, don't say that. It is real. I'm telling you it's real. And he said, okay, okay. I corrected anybody who said if. Because I knew it. And we prayed all night again. Then the next day, I got a call from, uh, what was the name of that lady? Elsie Felty. Remember Elsie Felty? Yeah. yeah. And, and she she passed? Yeah. She worked for the uh, the guy who ran the Sun Sentinel. Yeah. And she called me up and she said, Pastor, you're not going to believe this, but while we were praying last night, there was an earthquake in Cuba. And she said it destroyed a nuclear power plant that was being built on a fault. And, and she said it would have gone on, and, online, but it wasn't online yet. And then we saw it in the magazine. We read it in the magazine. I forget what magazine it was, but like Time or Newsweek or something. And it said that, uh, it said that, it, well, the defective parts, yeah, but it was being built on a fault and it, and it would come online the next February. I forget what month that was. And they said that if that had, earthquake had happened after it had been up and running, there would have been uh, a nuclear cloud over South Florida within hours. And, when, and the next three days would have gone up the whole East Coast. And so I would say that's amazing. Yes. Would you say that's amazing? Yes. And so if our little church never did another thing, but, but to pray away the nuclear holocaust off the East Coast, I would say, praise God. It, it, it was a victory. Yes. It was pretty good. <laughs> praise you, Jesus. For sparing the people. Imagine all the poor little children and wow. folks that would have suffered. Oh my gosh, it's more than you can to think of. And the Lord and the Lord uh, spared us. Thank and glory be to him. But uh, it, 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 there's exceeding great power to us. Imagine us that we can move heaven with our prayers so that God sends an earthquake to stop a disaster to happen that he was showing me was going to happen. That's what he does. But he's got to find somebody who's plugged in, who's in tune, and who's willing to act upon what he does and says, and believes him. What about, he said, I don't know what that is. That's crazy. I'm not going to start telling people that. They're going to think I'm nuts. And they did. You know, you, you ever, you, with pastors, you know, and the pastors are good men, but they go, you tell them stuff like that, and they go, Oh, okay, brother. You know, sure, we'll pray about that. All right. Hey, Joe. You know. And... <laughs> but it happened, and the Lord delivered us. There's great power, the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe. That's the faith part. The power is released when we believe. The power is released when we hear from God and get faith. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then when we believe it and when we speak it and we act on it. That's where the power comes from. The, us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. This is the type of power that's available to the church of Jesus Christ. And who is that? Are you a member of the church? Available to you then. Paul is praying that the eyes of your and my understanding would be enlightened to know this exceeding greatness of his power. And it's the same power according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought 